Good morning everyone and welcome to our morning worship today. Uh, this morning we welcome back as our preacher Seth Rigglesworth from Hollywell Free Church in Loughborough. Uh, we do thank him for coming and look forward to his ministry and it's worth making the point at this stage that we do value and appreciate the support and encouragement that our brothers and sisters at Hollywell uh, have been giving us in recent months. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Seth as he leads us in worship. Hello to all of you over at East Leek. A real privilege to be invited again to lead you in this time of worship this morning uh, and also to bring God's word to you a little bit later on. I'm going to start by reading just a single verse uh, from the book of Isaiah. The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth, and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. That's quite a strong condemnation on the people of Israel and the worship that they were bringing to God. And it's certainly our desire that our time of worship this morning would not be simply uh, honouring with our lips and coming near to God with our mouths at least not if it's at the expense of our hearts being engaged with what we're about to do. We don't want this worship just to be a time of following rules taught by men. We want this to be a time where our whole hearts are engaged in worshipping the God that we claim to approach. Before we begin uh, more formally our time of worship then, let's just pause for a moment together and prepare ourselves for what we are about to engage in. Would you take some time to prepare your own heart personally for the worship you are about to commit? As is the case in many different chapters in Isaiah, God quite quickly moves from a tone of condemnation to a tone of hope and rejoicing. Later in the very same chapter, God says, In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of the gloom and the darkness the eyes of the blind will see. Once more the humble will rejoice in the Lord, and the needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. When they see among them their children, the work of my hands, they will keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob, and they will stand in awe of the God of Israel. God makes these great promises that in a day coming, he will enable his people to worship him truly. We rejoice because that day has already come with the coming of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus. And so we are glad that our worship this morning is not vanity, it's not simply an offering of our lips, but we are enabled by the spirit that lives and works in each one of us to bring our worship in spirit and in truth. Our first hymn that we're going to sing together is a prayer asking God to help us in the worship that we are bringing to him this morning. We're going to sing, Come Thou Almighty King.
Well, would you uh, continue our worship of God as we come to him in prayer now together? Would you pray with me? Our Lord God and Heavenly Father, we each know of our own weaknesses when it comes to our worship and our praise and our honour of you. Those weaknesses might come as the distractions that whistle round our minds and round our hearts, even during this time of prayer and during our singing. It might be through our low vision of your majesty, whether through ignorance or obstinate dis disbelief. It might be because we are so used to fixing our eyes on what is seen around us and basing our uh, motives and our a response against those things rather than against the promises of your word. And we also recognise our weakness uh, throughout the week in our service of you, in our knowledge of you and in our love of you. We chase after so many empty and weak idols, things of this world which cannot satisfy and which cannot fulfil. Uh, we are so often pulled uh, aside by the things of this world uh, away from following you and away from being obedient to you. We so often are tempted to look back at what we've left behind, just like Lot's wife did. We're so often seeking our own glory rather than your glory. And yet, although these things are true and although we bring them to you this morning in, in, a, in an act of confession and recognition of our own weakness, yet we have so much reason to rejoice. We have so many reasons to be thankful and to give you praise because although sin still, uh, still mars us uh, and slows us down in our, in our race uh, that we run for Christ's sake, yet the, the victory against sin is already ours. It is already complete. We are already your people. We are your holy saints. We are free from sin, free from its power, uh, free from its control, free from uh, being deceived by the promises it makes. And as we pause in our week this morning to, uh, to spend this time deliberately to worship you, to fix our thoughts and our minds and our hearts upon you and your word, as we come to have our hearts refreshed and we come to praise you. We praise you for your mercy towards us. Uh, we praise you that you have not treated us as our sins deserve. We praise you that you remain faithful to us, even despite our unfaithfulness towards you. We praise you that our sins are no longer counted against us, but as Isaiah himself uh, reminded us, that they have been washed Though our sins once were like scarlet, they are now whiter than snow. 
we have been clothed in righteousness that is not ours, a righteousness that is given to us by Christ. And it, and it covers us and it drenches us and it clothes us. And it's in his righteousness that we approach you now. It's in his righteousness that we approach your throne and bring these prayers of praise and worship and honour. Lord, Heavenly Father, in our time of worship, in our service this morning, uh, we aim to meet with you. We desire to hear from you. Would you grant us your light and your presence? Enable us to see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ as we behold him in your word. Grant us your spirit, that spirit which is described as a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in order that we might know you better and might know better the power that works within each one of us, your people. Father, as we are reminded uh, by the very act of gathering online, uh, the way that churches are running at the moment is so far from the ideal, the pattern of your word. And so we pray with urgency about this situation that we find ourselves in. We pray for a lifting of the restrictions. We pray um, that you would uh, bring about an opportunity for churches to meet together once again. Uh, we pray for East Leek Fellowship, that you would enable them to Meet, meet up in the, in the village hall um, and resume meetings together. Father, we pray for this because we recognise the damage that this pandemic has done to the witness of the church in uh, restricting the meeting, the gathering together of believers, which is part of our public praise and worship and honouring of you. We recognise the hindrance it has been to our fellowship. We recognise the hindrance it has been to discipleship, to the building up of each other. And we recognise how it has restricted opportunities for us to share our love for one another. Father, we would pray in this regard for our rulers, just as you teach us to pray. We pray for those who are in authority over us. Guide them as they make decisions and uh, plan the way forward out of this pandemic. Help them to make wise decisions. Help them to consider carefully uh, all aspects of the restrictions that they impose, not just the, um, the impact it will have on the virus, not just the economic impact, but the impact it will have spiritually. Cause them to prioritise the spiritual needs of the people in this nation. And Father, we pray for ourselves. Help us to submit to those rulers that you have put over us, to submit to them in uh, quietness and civil obedience, not grumbling, not speaking falsely against them, not bearing false testimony where we ought not. Help us to live contentedly, recognising that the situation, as undesirable as it is, and as keen as we are to escape it, yet still is a circumstance which remains within your control. And you are still able to work out your purposes even through this pandemic. Help us then to be content and patient in the situation that we find ourselves. We pray for our time of worship this morning, that you would bless us as we read your word together, as we sing your praise, and as we hear from you in the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to uh, read now from God's word. Uh, the passage that we'll be studying this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 7 verse 31 Mark chapter 7 verse 31 Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon uh, and went through Sidon down to the sea of Galilee and to the region of the Decapolis There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. 
Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. You might want to keep a bookmark in that page of your Bibles because that will be the passage that I'm referring to later on in the sermon. Before we come to that, uh, we're going to sing once more. Uh, this time we're going to sing Love Divine or Love's Excelling. Uh, quite a well-known hymn, I'm sure familiar to many of you. Uh, but just take note that the love that we're speaking of is not an abstract noun, uh, but it is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the love divine revealed to us. Let's sing Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Well, 
Uh, just before I continue, I'm sure a number of you can notice a change in the lighting and uh, I've got my jumper on. Uh, there's obviously been some change here. I had a few technical glitches and struggled to finish the recording yesterday, so I've had to come back the day after to record the sermon. Just to put your mind at rest about the changes you can see on the screen. I, I wonder if you're ever so struck by the powerful effectiveness of a particular brand or product that you become a lifelong devotee uh, to that one thing. Maybe tea bags is your thing. There is one particular brand of tea bags that you always buy. For us, Yorkshire tea, uh, what else? Maybe it's uh, the brand of car that you drive. Uh, you know, you will only buy a Ford or you will only buy a Toyota because you just think no other car brand is as reliable uh, or as worthwhile to buy than that brand. Uh, for, for me, one, one we have in our house is branded scouring pads, Brillo pads. They're the only sort of scouring pad I, I think does any sort of use when you're washing up. Uh, and we don't bother buying the cheap sponges. We always get the Brillo ones because they're just so effective at what they claim to do they're worth the extra cost. Uh, of course, I'm not here though, am I, to talk to you about products and personal preferences of, of what car you drive uh, and other sorts of things. I'm here to talk to you about Jesus. But let's ask the same question about Jesus. Is Jesus really worthwhile? Is he effective at what he claims to do? Or is he as some people claim, simply a nice idea that helps us be nicer people? Is he just a religious crutch to get us through those difficult stages of life uh, and through the daunting moments of death? Or is he something more? Important questions that we have to ask ourselves about our own faith. Now, when Mark wrote his gospel, he did it first with the intention of being accurate, historically accurate, giving us a good account of who Jesus was and what he did. But he wanted to be more than simply accurate. He wanted to be convincing. And so the passages that he wrote about, the miracles that he recalls for us, and not simply those things that he can remember the best. They're the things which he feels are able to best portray to us the uniqueness of Jesus. Not just his uniqueness, but also his effectiveness. And the fact that he really is worthwhile following. So as we review today's miracle, we'll probably find, you'll probably see that it's not that remarkable a miracle in terms of its uniqueness compared to many of the other miracles that Jesus performed. But it is helpful in showing us just who Jesus is, how effective he is at what he came to do, and how ultimately worthwhile it is to follow him. Our aim and intention this morning is that we would be saying the same things as the crowd say at the end of the passage, he has done all things well. That's what I want you to see this morning, that Jesus is the one who does everything well. Well, let's dive into these verses then, and let's have a look at the miracle and see what Mark is trying to show us. Now, verse 31, Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee into the region of the Decapolis. The Decapolis, the, the ten towns. Now, these towns are mainly Greek, uh, Greek people living there, Greek-speaking Greek people. Uh, and that's interesting. It's only a minor detail, but it's interesting and almost unique in Jesus' ministry. Jesus came first to reach the Jewish people. And that's what was part of his rebuttal to uh, the Syrophoenician woman in verse 27 of this same chapter. Jesus came to reach the Jews first. And yet he moves away from his schedule, away from his uh, normal path of ministry, in order to come to these 10 Greek towns. Jesus doesn't let race or nationalism or, uh, or ethnicity cause him to separate himself from these people. He doesn't let their obscurity uh, separate himself from them. Uh, the gospel message 
need not be reserved to only those that we feel are most ready to hear it or most suited for it. Jesus' command to his disciples eventually would be go into all the world without exception and preach this message. It was an instruction that he practiced as well as preached. Jesus goes to this obscure and small town, the, the Decapolis. Verse 32, then as he gets there, some people bring to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. Now, before we move on, just try and get yourself inside the mind of this man. We don't have a lot of information about him, but what we do is significant. A few weeks ago, I had the unfortunate experience of uh, quite a lot of wax building up in my ears. And it meant that I couldn't hear things properly in the world around me. I couldn't follow a conversation, even with one person, unless I could see their lips moving. Uh, I couldn't listen to a conversation around the table because I couldn't pick up where the different voices were coming from. I couldn't hear the traffic as I was walking or cycling along the roads. I couldn't watch the TV without it turned up to max volume. I couldn't listen to music very well because I could only hear one part of the music and not the, the, the full uh, harmony. And it felt during those weeks like I was almost becoming an observer on life. It was like I was watching life through a glass window. I could see quite clearly everything that was happening, but I couldn't hear very well. And although I could still speak, uh, it felt like I was cut off from the world that I was watching. And that was only a hearing impairment. Now consider the fate of this man. He was totally deaf and he could hardly talk. His... his uh, understanding of the way his, his involvement in the world would have been severely limited. I have no doubt that this man would be exceptionally shy and timid, quite retiring, uh, not wanting to put himself forward because he wouldn't feel able to defend himself or assert himself in new situations. And that's backed up by the fact that when this newcomer Jesus arrives at their town, uh, this man stays in the background until some of his friends bring him to Jesus. He doesn't approach of his own accord. Verse 32, when they bring him to Jesus, uh, they begged Jesus to place his hand on the man. Now that's probably not a request for healing. More likely it's a request for Jesus to bless him. Surely this man would look like he needed blessing. And how does Jesus respond? Does he answer their request for blessing? Well, yes and no. He doesn't answer in the way they expect, at least. But does he bless the man? Oh, certainly. He blesses the man with far more than any sort of blessing he might have expected to receive. And that's backed up by the people's amazement at the fact that he is actually healed. Jesus so often answers us with far more than we ever ask for. He knows what we need and what is best for us, even better than we know it ourselves. It's interesting, I was reading about William Carey, uh, a, a Baptist missionary, uh, this last week. Uh, and I was reading about how before he became a Christian, um, he'd prayed for God's blessing. He'd stolen some of his employer's money and replaced it with a counterfeit coin. And he was praying to God for, uh, he felt remorse at what he'd done. And he was praying for God to bless him so that the, this uh, misdeed would not be found out. And his bargain with God was that if I don't get found out, I will never do it again. I will be more obedient to you in future. And God answered his prayer, but not by hiding the sin. Uh, his employer found out. Uh, the person who uh, received the, the counterfeit coin off his employer also found out. And it was traced back to William. Uh, you might think, well, how is that a blessing at all? Well, in the moment, certainly it wasn't a blessing. But those two individuals and the way they dealt with William Carey were instrumental in William Carey eventually coming to put his trust in Jesus Christ. God blessed William Gary through that prayer, not in a way that he expected, but far beyond what he even asked for. Jesus, uh, verse 33, takes this blind, uh, this deaf and mute man aside. 
He takes him away from the crowd. Now, why do we have that detail? Why would Jesus do that? Well, again, put yourself inside the shoes of this deaf and mute man. This shy, timid, unassuming man. He'd be very shy, be very perhaps fearful of standing in front of the crowd. And Jesus doesn't, he, he, Jesus knows what he's about to do for this man. And he knows the glory it could bring to him and the fame it could bring. And yet he doesn't use it for his own gain. He steps aside from the crowd. He doesn't treat this as a, 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 just a, another copy and paste miracle performance. Um, lay the hand, say the words, heal the man, stun the crowd. That's not how Jesus acts. He treats the man as an individual. He recognizes his needs. He's gentle with him and compassionate. And he steps aside from the crowd, perhaps to a private little area where they can just engage one-to-one. Perhaps with some of the men, the man's friends with him, perhaps with some of Jesus' own disciples there too. Jesus takes care of the individual. Jesus knows his sheep, not just generically. He doesn't just know what Christians are like. He knows each of his sheep by name, he tells us. He knows you. He knows your needs. And he knows how best to deal with you. He's placed you in this position at this time because he knows you and the way he's gifted you and what is right for you and how he is going to use you. You're not treated in Jesus' kingdom just as a generic subject. You're treated as an individual. And he cares with us as he cares for us as he knows best. Verse 33 still. Then the man heals, uh, uh, Jesus heals the man. In rather an unusual way, wouldn't you agree? Jesus spits, puts his fingers in the man's ears, touches his tongue. What is it that's going on here? Is this some kind of magic ritual that Jesus is performing? Uh, well, no, of course not. Again, put yourself in this man's shoes. He can't hear anything. He can barely speak. Language would have been quite difficult for him to learn if he's had these impairments all of his life. And so rather than explaining with words what he's about to do, Jesus indicates to him what he's about to do. Your ears, yeah? And your tongue, yeah? I'm going to heal them. Spit was uh, widely recognised as a, a healing uh, medium. It's interesting, this last week, my daughter, Mary, cut her finger. And what do you do when you cut your finger? Well, you put it in your mouth, don't you? You, you lick it, you suck it, and it, it helps the, the cut heal quicker, helps it stop bleeding. Spittle is used for healing. And so Jesus uses his own spittle, and he touches the man's ears, and he touches the man's tongue, indicating to the man, I'm going to heal your ears and your tongue. And Jesus, verse 34, looks up to heaven and with a deep sigh says, Ephatha, which means be opened. It's a sigh of emotion that Jesus feels on behalf of this man in the situation. Perhaps it's a sigh of frustration at the effects of sin and the damage it's done to this man. Perhaps it's a sigh of sympathy with the hardships he faces. Perhaps it's a sigh of relief at the healing that he's about to receive. All those emotions Jesus commonly shows in his healing miracles. And with Jesus' words be opened, the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened. It's interesting that those uh, adjectives are uh, very closely linked to being set free from a prison, to be loosened or to be opened up. It's a release, it's a liberty that this man receives not simply a healing. The man is as if set free. Verse 36 and verse 37, it's no surprise then that on seeing this incredible transformation, the crowd are simply amazed at Jesus' power and ability. What have they seen to make them amazed? Well, well just go back through those points that we've noted. For starters, Jesus has come out of his way to our irrelevant little town to speak to poor little us. And as he's come, he hasn't come to push his own agenda, but he's listened carefully to the needs of our people. And he's blessed us with even more than we hoped for or even asked for. 
And he hasn't done it in a way that shows off and makes himself famous and gets all eyes on him. He's done it a way that, in a way that cares for the, for the individual, that builds them up and protects them and nurtures them in the way that they need. And most of all, he's, he's performed this wonder, which we have never seen anything of the like before. I want to ask, what sort of God do you follow? People make gods of all sorts of things in this world. Gods of money, gods of power and uh, control, gods of comfort and entertainment. And there's no denying that there is a, a certain glory to be found in each of those gods. Who doesn't want more money in the bank? Who doesn't want to be popular? Who doesn't want a life of ease and leisure? But how worthwhile are those gods really to follow? How effective are they at what they claim to do? Consider, since when has the God of money ever stepped down to, to, into the, the fringes and the gutters of society to nurture and provide for the weakest and the most vulnerable? Money doesn't do that. Money says, you can have these glories of mine if you work your way up to me. If you earn enough money from you, for yourself, then you can enjoy the good gifts that I have to offer. And always those glories are just out of reach, just a little bit further to go. Jesus deals with the vulnerable. The gods of power and influence and control. When have they ever prioritized the weakest? When have they ever gone out of their way to consider the needs of the most obscure by their very nature, they're all about the popular ones and preserving the popularity of the popular ones, the powerful ones, the influential ones. The gods of entertainment have never successfully comforted anyone in times of real discomfort. Who, when grieving, has ever said, oh, never mind, there's another episode of Coronation Street on. The god of Islam similarly, has never experienced the temptation towards sin. He's never experienced personally the pain of sorrow. The gods of Buddhism has no concern for the suffering that you feel, only they mock it as foolish attachment to the physical world. The gods of Hinduism will not feed you unless you first feed them. But what about Jesus? Isn't he so different? Especially when you see him act in this way that we see him in this little account that Mark has provided for us. You see, Jesus steps into our situation. Jesus steps aside from the crowd to deal with the individual. He approaches us. He makes the adjustment to meet the needs of the weaker one. And not only does he bend down to help us, but he walks the same path through life with us. A path marked by temptation, pain, sorrow, and grief. Jesus' message is not just for the few, not just for the elite. Jesus' message is for the many. The Christian life doesn't come with an entry exam. There's no bar that you have to pass before you can come to Jesus. He steps aside. He stoops down to pick us up from where we are already at. We see in this miracle a characteristic display of Jesus as the one who does everything well, compassionately, gently, full of love. But you know, I think actually, Mark wants us to see more than just Jesus as the compassionate and gentle one. It's not very obvious in our English translations, but Mark has provided an important hint here uh, to get us thinking about another part of the Bible. Take, for example, if I spoke to, if I, if I began speaking about in the beginning, your mind might go to Genesis chapter 1 or John chapter 1. Uh, perhaps I might talk about light and momentary afflictions. Your mind, on hearing those words, goes to 2 Corinthians. Uh, perhaps I might speak about the only begotten Son. Of course, your mind flicks to John chapter 3. Well, it's interesting that Mark does a similar thing in his passage. There's a word that he uses, the word that describes the man who could hardly talk, 
a word that is only used in one other place in the whole of the Bible. And as he uses it, it's designed to get us thinking about that one other place. That other place is Isaiah 35. And if you're able, you might turn to Isaiah 35 now. In chapter 35 of Isaiah, Isaiah is offering Israel a rousing encouragement. Verse, uh, verse 3, Isaiah says, Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Why not? Well, your God will come. He will come with a vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Isaiah is saying, God himself is going to come and rescue you. He's going to come and save you. What will this salvation be like, I wonder? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue, that's Mark's word, the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool in the thirsty ground bubbling springs, in the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and papyrus will grow. You see what Mark's saying? He's saying Jesus is the one who's bringing forth this salvation that Isaiah had promised all those years ago. If you're willing to make the inference, in fact, Jesus is the God who will come to save you. Jesus is the Messiah that was promised to Israel, that so many had been waiting for, and the day has come when God is finally bringing about his great salvation. And once we've grasped that fact, then the full extent of Isaiah 35 becomes apparent in Jesus' ministry. Let's keep reading and see what else Isaiah says about this salvation. Verse 8, a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The unclean will not journey on it. It will be for those who walk in that way. Wicked fools will not go about on it. Verse 10, but only the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return. They will enter Zion, that is the city of God, with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrowing and sighing will flee away. Notice at least two important things from these verses. First, what is the fullness of the salvation that Jesus is coming to bring? It says there's a, a way of holiness that is going to be set up, a new path through life, a new journey to walk on. And where does that path lead? It leads to Zion, the city of God, the place where God himself lives and dwells. And that place is described as a place of everlasting joy, where gladness and joy overtake us, where disability and impairment and deafness and muteness and death even will not need to be driven out because it will already be gone. Sorrowing and sighing have fled away and gladness and joy are, are belong to those who dwell in that city. Eternal joys even. That's the extent of the salvation that is offered. But secondly, notice, how is it that we get to that place? You see, it's not everybody who walks on this path. The unclean will not journey on it. Wicked fools will not go about on it. It is those who are, verse 9, redeemed. Only the redeemed will walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord will return. Those who have been redeemed, that is, bought. Those who have been ransomed, that is, paid for and rescued. Now, the obvious question is, when is this redeeming, when is this ransom going to be paid? When is this rescue going to happen? Later in Mark's gospel, Mark records Jesus himself telling his disciples, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Jesus ransoms his people, not simply from the physical ailments and the disabilities that we suffer as the result of sin in this world, 
He didn't have to offer his life for that, did he? He didn't offer his life to heal uh, the, the, the deaf man from his deafness. Jesus ransoms his people from the grip of sin. That is the penalty we deserve, the punishment we deserve for sin, but also the influence of sin, the bondage to sin. And he achieves it by offering his own life as a ransom payment. He gives his own life so that we can be set free. Now ask yourself, which other God will do that for you? Which other God does it for you? The God of Islam, he asks you to pay your own ransom by storing up good deeds that outweigh your bad. The gods of Hinduism, well, they say there's simply no escape from this ransom. Uh, karma will come to get you, whatever. And you're stuck in this endless cycle of judgment and condemnation. The gods of pleasure, entertainment, money, influence, they don't try and deal with the problem at all. They don't address the ransom that needs paying. They don't free you from sin. They simply try and entertain you and distract you while you're stuck in the prison of sin. Only Jesus deals with our greatest need. Only he is able and only he has paid the ransom on our behalf. And only he can be trusted to ensure that we will not be condemned to suffer justice at the hands of God. Justice against the wrong that we have done. Justice against our rejection of God. Justice against our own hurt that we cause to others around us and even our own selves. You see, when the crowd in Mark's gospel exclaimed that Jesus does everything well, Mark wants you to realise just how much truth was packed into that statement that they unwittingly made. He wants you to feel the full force of that comment. Jesus does do everything well. He's not simply come to offer relief to the deaf and the mute and the lame. In fact, those miracles that Jesus performs are, are simply signs pointing forward to the greater work that he is doing for everyone, not just the disabled. Is Jesus worth following? Is he effective at what he does? Is he worth being loyal to as you would be loyal to a brand or product? Is he effective at what he's come to do? You know, if you treat Jesus simply as a means to be a morally good person, if you treat Jesus simply as uh, a way to uh, fill your time on a Sunday morning, if you treat Jesus uh, just as someone who can help you seem respectable to your family or your friends, then perhaps he's not all that effective. Perhaps there are other gods that you could follow which would be equally as effective. But then, that's not what Jesus has come to do for you. That's not what he's claiming to offer. But when you see Jesus as the one who can pay the ransom to free us from sin. If you see Jesus as the one who can lead us on this path of holiness to Zion, the city of God, the place of everlasting joy, then there really is no comparison with any other God. There's no other God who can do that. There's no other God who has done that. And Jesus is the only one who has shown himself able and willing to lead you on that path to that place of everlasting joy. These miracles he performed were just a, a taster of that. Uh, the ultimate miracle is death and resurrection uh, guarantees that he is able to fulfill that promise. We too can know that the destiny of Zion will be our destiny when we recognise that Jesus is the one who does everything well. We're going to end our time of worship by singing How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. Mm -hmm. 